title of today's sermon is Empowering People. It's a play on words, a little bit. It has two meanings. One, uh, people that empower people, empowering people, and for us to be an empowering people that empowers others. You know, when I was in high school, uh, I used to play a lot of tennis. I was really, actually, I'm not bad. I, I, I played like two, three times a week, and, and I was pretty good. And uh, I had a, a, a close friend, a dear friend. His name was John, John Kim. And actually, John was much better than me. In fact, he played on our high school tennis team. He was ranked number four. Now, John and I, we played a lot. We played basketball together. We played uh, uh, we, go, we went to watch movies together, we hung around, we played computer games together. We were close friends and we did almost everything together. But there was one thing that he would not do it with me. There was one thing that he wouldn't do or play with me. And that was he would not play tennis with me. And when he told me, you know, one, you know during one uh, afternoon I said, John, let's go play tennis. He says, Oh, yeah, I'm gonna, I want to play tennis. Let's go play, it, play tennis. And he goes like, well, I am going to go play tennis, but I'm not going to play with you today. And uh, when he said that, I was actually bothered and a little bit upset. I'm like, why aren't you going to play with me? And his response was the thing that made me upset. He said, I'm not going to play with you because, Paul, you are not really that good. And when he said that, Paul, I'm not going to play with you because you're really not that good, actually, he didn't mean it it as an insult. What he meant to say was this. What he was trying to say was this. You see, John, as I mentioned, was ranked number four in his school in playing tennis. And he had a goal. He wanted to become the number one. But this is what he said. He said, Paul, the reason why I can't play with you is this. If I play tennis with you, and I'm sorry to say Sorry to say this, but if I play with you, actually playing with you will not help me to become a better tennis player. In fact, playing with you will actually diminish my skill. At first, when he said that, I was really bothered by it because I was insulted. I felt like, first of all, he's calling me a bad tennis player, which I thought I was and I'm not. And secondly, you know, I thought he was just making a lame excuse because he didn't want to play with me. But then the more I thought about it, and the more I talked to others about it, actually, John wasn't being rude to me, or he wasn't trying to be uh, arrogant. Actually, he was speaking the truth. When you're at a high level, you're not going to improve your skill by playing with somebody who's uh, at a lower level. And for those of you, I think you will understand, for those of you who are trying to improve English, you're not going to significantly improve your English by speaking, you know, practicing your English with an elementary school student from a public school here. You're not. You're going to end up mainly trying to teach him. You might improve just a little bit. But in fact, it'll just get you to be more bored. In order for John to improve his tennis skill, he said, you know, I have to be around those people who are better than me. And even though I might lose at times, playing against them will improve my skill and my ability. The same principle applies, believe it or not, when it, uh, when it comes to our spiritual lives. There are those people that are around us that will lift us to a higher level. And then there are those around us who will drag us down or bring us down to a lower level. And these are, this is some of the things as Christians we need to be aware of. Well, in fact, not just as Christians, as a person, as people. This is a principle, this is a truth that we need to be aware of, that there are those people around us, they may be good people, they may be nice people, but there are those people that will raise us up to a higher level spiritually, and then there are those of us who will bring us down to a lower level spiritually. This is mentioned in Proverbs chapter 13. This principle is clearly mentioned in Proverbs 13, verse 20, and 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33. Let's read all this together in one voice. Begin. Walk with the wise and become wise. Associate with fools and get in trouble. Louder, all together. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Begin. Don't be fooled by those who say such things, for bad company corrupts good character. 
Now, what the Bible is telling us is this. The Bible is sharing with us a principle in how people around us, people that we associate with, how they affect us. Sometimes we think to ourselves, no it doesn't, no it doesn't. Well, today I want to share with you that it does. And the Bible gives us a clear principle that it really does. Walking with the wise people makes us wise. Walking with people that are foolish makes us behave foolish. Walking with people with bad character leads us into that path also. You know, whether we want to admit it or not, we are people that are easily influenced. We may not agree, but we, we are easily influenced. The way we talk, you know, I remember uh, one of the pastors that I knew in, uh, uh, in America. He had a very, he, he had a Korean accent when he spoke English. And uh, he married a wife who was almost second generation. She was like born in Korea but uh, moved to America when she was three or four. So she couldn't even speak Korean. I mean, I mean very little, minimal. And yet after living with her husband who had an English accent, she began to speak English also with the Korean accent just like her husband. Believe it or not, even the way we talk, we're influenced. Uh, enunciation, our pronunciation, certain accents. For those of you who, who are from different parts, you know, think about it. You all speak, you know, according to that region. Why? It's not because you were born there. It's because of the people around you. Why is it that people that live in Canada always go, A? Hey. Even our personality. Sometimes when we live around people who, are, who tend to be busy all the time, we tend to act really busy as well. For those of us who grew up in a house, and I, I, I hate to admit this, but you know, my children are beautiful. They're wonderful children, but they are loud. One time we went to Chicago to visit my wife's sister, and she has two children. When you ride in a car with uh, her two children, it's almost surreal because you forget that they're sitting in the back seat because they're so quiet. You will never feel that way when you arrive in the car with my children because they are loud. Their voice is loud. And one day, you know, we're talking and we're, you know, correcting our children. Why are you speaking so loudly? You know, speak quietly. And I realize that they're that way because of us. I speak loudly. I have a loud voice. Our personality, our demeanor, you know, we're easily influenced. Even our sense of humor. You know, I, I've noticed something. My son and daughter, they have my sense of humor too. Very funny. Not corny, very funny. <laughs> you know, even some of the habits, the way you eat, the way you hold your forks, the way you, you know, your taste in food. Uh, some of your values, believe it or not, even the values is different. Some of my friends, you know, they say they wake up early and do their work early. Why? Because they grew up in a place where everyone gets up early. Even some of our values. And believe it or not, even our priorities. It is easily influenced by those who are around us. And the question that I want to ask you is this. Who is around you? Who is around your life? And what are some of the ways you are being influenced? You know, in America, they did a survey. And they found that children whose parents were teachers, on the average, did much better academically than those whose parents were not teachers. Then why do you think that? Why do you think that is the case? Do you think it's because, the, you know, if the parents were teachers, they naturally have a smarter gene, therefore it is passed down to their children? Not true. You know, most people are, you know, many people are smart, not just teachers. But the reason why children whose parents are teachers tended to do better in school and were smarter was simply this. Parents who were teachers had a habit on the average, tended to have a habit of reading more. Parents who, you know, who were teachers read more at home. They did their work more at home. They did you know, grading papers. And when children see that, they automatically, they copy and imitate what parents did. So children whose parents were teachers tended to read more than children whose parents were doing something else. Again, it's another example that shows that you know, people are easily influenced, just like children. You know, my, my children, I hate to, again, <laughs> I'm a pastor, I like to be transparent. You know, I hate to admit this, but even my children, they love to watch television. Do you know why? The answer is obvious. 
because Esther loves to watch television. <laughs> okay, you know me. <laughs> you know me well. It's me. I love to watch television. In fact, I watch television a lot. You know, throughout the day, I work hard. But when I come home, I relax by watching television. And I come to realize that, you know, my son is just like me. And what's even more scary, scary is that my daughter, who didn't used to like watch, watching television, now watches a lot of television too. Why? Because we're easily influenced by those who are around us. Children imitate and follow their parents. Children are parents that like to uh, read, read more. Children are parents that like to watch television, watch television more. Children are parents that lie, lie. In a neg also in a negative way, children are parents that respect you know, their parents, guess what? They will respect you. Children are parents that are respectful of others, guess what? They will be respectful as well. So as parents, if you want your children to become great people, first, you and we, us, we need to practice becoming great people. Why? Because they will imitate, and, and without knowing, we will influence them. And oftentimes, when I was in America, I used to teach parenting classes, and parents would often say, by the way, this sermon is not about parenting, but I'm just mentioning. Even in my America, when I was teaching in parenting class, parents would often come up to me and say, you know, Pastor, how do I encourage, how do I motivate my children to study? How do I motivate my children to become great people? You know, how can I make my children study harder? And I told them, you cannot make your children study harder. You cannot make your children become doctors. You cannot make your children get straight A's. Those things will only happen if they want to do it. And the best thing that you can do as parents is to influence them, empower them to want to do great things. How? Number one, setting an example. You study hard. You do great things, and they will follow you. Another thing is, if you want to empower them, and, you know, surround them with great people. You know, you know, again, this is a similar survey, and you're going to see a trend here. Do you know that the children whose parents are doctors has a higher, greater chance of becoming doctors than those who are not? Do you know why? Because children of parents whose parents are doctors are around doctors more often. They see doctors all the time. They live at hospital. They see it. They see the great work. And guess what? They're influenced by that, and they choose to become doctors. Do you see a pattern? So I tell the parents all the time, if you want to encourage your children to become great, surround them with great people. Take them, don't just watch TV all the time. I'm speaking to myself here. Take them to the hospitals. Show them around. Introduce them to different doctors. Do you know this fact also? Do you know that the children whose parents are pastors or missionaries, they have a greater chance of being in the ministry when they get older, either as pastors, missionaries, or other type of uh, ministry? Why? Because they grow up surrounded, always being influenced by those people. Because you're, if you're pastors, missionaries always constantly come by your home. When you're pastors, you have great men that always come visit you. And your children, your child sees those things. And they're empowered and they're influenced by those things. See, we are a people that are easily influenced. Therefore, we need to be aware of that and realize that and use that in our lives. Number one, we need to be aware that we too can be easily influenced in a positive way, but also in a negative way. And we too must realize that in our lives, we can influence others in a positive way and also in a negative way. Again, if you don't believe what I say, look around this society, look around the world. When, we, when I go to Daejeon train station, I see homeless people lying on the bench, sleeping. In America, when you walk around, you see homeless people under the bridge. Let me ask you this. Do you think there's those, every one of those homeless people, do you think they are homeless because they wanted to be homeless? Do you think there's a homeless person that exists today that when they were young, they decided, you know what, when I grow up, I want to be a homeless person? No. In America, there are many people who are addicted to drugs. Do you think there's, you know, there's, there was a, any one of those people that said, you know, when they were young, they said, when I grow up, I want to be a drug addict. 
Do you think people you know, that are in prison right now said, you know, when they were young, when I grow up, I want to be a thief. When I grow up, I want to be a you know, robber. When I grow up, I want to be a murderer. Do you think there's a person in prison who actually thought that when they were growing up? A single, uh, just one person that maybe, even one? The answer is no. No one wishes when they're young, when I grow up, I want to you know, be a bad person. I want to be a failure. But how do they end up being that way? It's because, the answer again, is because we are people that are easily influenced. People do drugs. Why? Because one, one time, on the, one, you know, at one point in their lives, somehow they were introduced and they had friends who did drugs. And it led them to do drugs. People that are homeless, now there are certain circumstances, maybe because of the economy, but they become, they fail in life. Why? Because oftentimes, sometimes people around them, they too were failures, and they led you, they led them into that direction. You see, no one wants to be poor. No one wants to be a failure. No one wants to be in jail. But people end up that way. Why? Because we're easily influenced people. People that are easily influenced by people that are around us. That's why the Bible is very clear cut when it comes to choosing friends. That's why the Bible is very clear cut when it comes to deciding what type of crowd and what type of people we should hang around. Again, Proverbs 13.20 says, Walk with the wise and become wise. Associate with fools and get in trouble. 1 Corinthians 15.33, Don't be fooled by those who say such things, for bad company corrupts good character. You know, years ago, a good friend of mine, I'll even tell you his name, Pastor Peter Lee, who, who spoke here at one time. He gave me really a wonderful compliment. This was years ago in America. He said, Paul, you know, he calls me. He was, uh, he was living in Dallas. I was living in Houston. He says, Paul, after we were talking for a while, he says, Paul, you know, I really enjoy talking with you. I said, really? Hmm, okay. Yeah, I'm a good conversationist. And conversationalist, maybe that's why. But he said, no, that's not it. The reason why I enjoy talking with you is that whenever I talk with you, I feel better. I feel better in that I feel more motivated. I feel better in that I feel like I need to do something great for God. You see, we have another friend, and I'm not going to mention his name for obvious reason. But we have another friend, but you know, he's a good guy. He's a pastor as well. But whenever Peter talks with him, he has this um, issue, actually, with finance. Uh, and to his credit, uh, he makes very little amount of money. He lives in, you know, uh, he, he makes very little amount of money. And whenever Peter talks with him, he's always talking about, you know, how am I going to send my children to college? I, have, I cannot save any money. He's always saying stuff like, man, I'm going to retire in about 20 years. I have no money for retirement. Now, he's not lying. He's not being a mean or bad person. He's just being, you know, speaking from his heart. But Peter tells me, you know, my friend Peter, he tells me that whenever he talks to this other friend, after the conversation, he's always thinking about, man, what am I going to do? He's, he begins to worry about money. He begins to worry about finance. He starts thinking about the future. He starts thinking about what can I do to save money, you know. And, and what happens is it makes him sad and miserable and makes him focus his life on money. But Peter said to me, Paul, but whenever I speak to you, it's different. Whenever I talk to you, always say stuff like, man, before we, our life is short, our time is short. Before we die, we need to do something great for God. You know, man, we, you know, and if you know me, you know that I actually talk about those things a lot. In fact, I even told my wife this morning, you know, I mean, this week I was talking about, honey, the, my greatest fear in life is to waste time because time is so short. And I always talk about that, you know. And I, let me just say this again to you as well. 
You know, for most of us here, we're going to live for another maybe, you know, 20, 30 years of healthy life and maybe additional 10, 20 years of elderly life. You know, that's a very short time. And we only have one life. And for me, I really want to live my life making a difference, do something meaningful. And when I stand before God, I don't want to look at God and I don't want to say, when God tells me, Paul, what did you do with your life? I don't want to say, God, I don't know. I want to stand before God and be able to say, God, I really, God, I may not have done great things, but I tried. And Peter always tells me, you know, Paul, whenever, you know, the reason I call you is because really after I talk with you, my mind, my motivation, my priorities, my perspective changes. See, this is why Bible tells us, makes a direct point about walking with good people, walking with spiritually people who are fired up and avoiding people who live foolish lives. Again, let me repeat to you. Walk with those who are wise, then become wise, but associate with fools and get in trouble. Bad company corrupts good character. Third John 1.11 says, Dear friend, don't let this bad example influence you. Follow only what is good. Remember that those who do good prove that they are God's children, and those who do evil prove that they do not know God. Again, the Bible makes a very clear point, clear point as, to, as to the fact that we need to make sure that we're around good people and avoid foolish people. When I was at seminary, I had to make an important decision. Uh, I had many friends, uh, l- like most of you do, but I had two friends at seminary. They were a little bit, they were both great people, but they were a little different. And this, again, seminary, this is where everyone uh, goes to study to prepare themselves to be pastors or missionaries. And I had one friend. I'll mention his name. His name was Joshua. He's a great guy, great friend. A little pecu- peculiar in his uh, behavior. Uh, you know, he's, he's very touchy and feely. Now, he's not gay or homosexual, but you know, he's always very t- touchy and feely. You know, one time I went, to, I went to a movie theater with him, two of us, two guys. And uh, at the movie theater, while he was watching movie, instead of sitting straight, he would rest his shoulder on my head on my shoulder while grabbing my arm. I'm like, Joshua, don't do that here. <laughs> but I loved him, and he was one of my closest and dearest friends at seminary, and I'll tell you why. I had another friend, and he was a really a good friend to me too. But this friend, oftentimes, whenever we got together, he would always say, hey, Paul, let's go watch a dollar movie. You know, we didn't watch regular movie. We watched dollar movie. Dollar movies are movies, you know, it's, it's not a new release. The come, movie comes out about eight months later, then, it, you know, it goes to dollar movie theater. And uh, I was a poor seminary student, so I would always go watch dollar movies. But this friend would always say, hey, Paul, let's go uh, watch dollar movie. This says, oh, Paul, hey, let's, let's, go, let's go to the rack and play some basketball. Hey, Paul, let's go, uh, let's go, you know, eat at a nice restaurant. I mean, he was a good friend to me. But whenever I was, hang- I was around this friend, all we did was play. And I needed that, some of it. But Joshua was different. You know, I had my own apartment at seminary, and Joshua's apartment was across the street. And I, back, just like now, back then, I loved television, and I would watch television. And for no, I mean, just in the middle of the night, or like 8.23 in the evening, he would knock on the door. Well, he, would, some, he wouldn't even knock. He'd see the light on, he would just come in. And I'm sitting on the couch, and I'm like, hey, Joshua, what's up? And he comes in, hey, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm watching TV. And it's like, he would nod his head, and he would walk by me and go into my room, because in my room, I have a guitar. And he would go into my room and open my guitar without permission. I didn't mind. We're good friends. And he started playing guitar, singing praises, and so forth. You know, you know, hide me now. You know, he would sing something like that. And then I'm sitting there watching television, you know, I'm watching like Seinfeld or something like that. There's no way you can watch television when someone's next, you know, next room praising and worshiping God. You can't. So 
sometimes begrudgingly, I'll turn off the TV, I go there, and I join him, and I sing and worship and praise and worship God. Joshua was also really a man of prayer. Whenever we hang around, we're always talking about God. And he always say, Paul, let's pray. Hey, let's go to the prayer room. At seminaries, there are prayer rooms everywhere. He said, Paul, let's pray. And this is one thing I noticed. One day I realized that when I'm around this other friend, all I really did was just play. But whenever I was around Joshua, we would worship. And we would pray. And at that moment, I made a conscious decision. I'm going to hang around Joshua more often. Because being around him empowers me to become a better Christian. Being around him empowers me to worship and love God more. That's how important it is to surround ourselves with great people. People that will lift us up. They will raise us up. So even as a pastor, you know, sometimes when I, you know, work throughout the week at school, it can get very mundane. You know, uh, you know grading papers, planning lesson plans, and, and so forth. Sometimes you're in a little bubble and you kind of forget who you are. And so I, I, so I regularly, I make sure that I do not lose focus. And that I'm also surrounded by people that are empowering me. So believe it or not, as a pastor, I'm, I often go on the internet and I listen to great pastors' sermon throughout. Uh, there's a website called oneplace.com and you can find all these pastors and their great sermons. And I try to always try to read some good books because hearing the words of these great people empowers me. And that is why it is important for all of us to also have quiet time regularly. Quiet time means spending quiet time with God, reading God's words, meditating on Him, and praying. See, those things empower us to do great things. So I want to close by sharing with you one final thought. It is important for us to walk with godly people. But I also want to share, remind you that it is very important for us to become that empowers and influences other people in a positive way, in a spiritual way. Leading people to seek after God, leading people to serve God, leading people to be obedient to God. When I was at seminary, whenever people would come up to me, say, Paul, what classes do you recommend that I, would take, I should take? And without a, without a, uh, without a doubt, without, uh, without exception, I always told him, before you graduate and before he retires, you have to take Dr. Roy Fish's class. Dr. Roy Fish was a very was an elderly uh, professor. He was a professor of evangelism. And I, I, I'm not exaggerating. I'm not exaggerating when I say this. Twice a week, every time, whenever I take his class, and when the class is over, my heart is so moved that his words always led me to go to the prayer room and pray for about 20, 30 minutes. Pray for me, praying for me and praying for those around us, praying for the lost people. Dr. Roy Fish, his testimony was this that when he was a young pastor, he noticed that he wasn't really passionate about God. He wasn't really passionate about people. And he said that every morning he would get up and on his knees he would pray to God. And he asked God, God, please give me heart for the lost people. Please give me passion for those people that do not know God. And he said he prayed that for few months and he says one day he was walking he was walking in his neighborhood and for some reason he just said he couldn't understand that whenever he saw someone he would just get really emotional and he would cry every time he would see a stranger's face that he would cry 
And the reason why he would cry is that every time he saw a stranger's face, he would see Jesus' face. Every time he see a stranger's face, he would, he, would, he would be reminded, what if this person did not know God? That he would live in eternity in hell. And every time he see a stranger's face, he would be overcome and overwhelmed with this emotion of seeing these people living in eternity in hell. And he would say he just could not control that emotion. And he would cry, he would weep, and he would pray. Imagine what type of man he was. And imagine the type of influence he had on me and other students. So today I want to close by showing you this video. It's a video of a, uh, to the song most of you know by Steve Green. It's called People Need the Lord. I thought about what better way to close this message by sharing with you images and the words that empowers me and the images and the words that will empower you to be a better Christian, to be a better follower of Christ.